Okay, Daniel chapter 5. If you notice the first two words, it says King Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar is gone. He's been gone for about 23 years, maybe a little bit more. He dies in about 562 B.C. His son takes over for two years. Then he's assassinated by his brother-in-law, and his brother-in-law's name is Neriglisar. Neriglisar rules in Babylon for about four years and then dies as king, leaving his little boy son to be the successor king. Little boy lasts about nine months and then a bunch of conspirators get together and beat him to death. That's wow. And uh, uh, one of the conspirators named Nebonidus is appointed to be the king. However, Nebonidus is not royalty. He's not one of Nebuchadnezzar's line. <clears throat> So he has some problems holding his rank and holding his position. So he marries either Nebuchadnezzar's widow or perhaps Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. We don't know what. There's no recorded history of this. And adopts the son, Belshazzar. And appoints Belshazzar king in Babylon. And then he becomes like a co-king and he goes... Many, 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 many miles away in this little oasis in the middle of the Arabian Desert. And that's where he's going to stay for the rest of his time. He rules for about 17 years. He? He, Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. But he's over in this area, over here. In Babylon, Belshazzar rules for 14 years. So out of 17 years, the last 14 years, Belshazzar is king or acting co-king in Babylon. The big city, the capital of the Babylonian captivity. But he is wicked. He is, he is just horrible, horrible king. Horrible king. But he doesn't care. Now why is this important? Primarily because up until about 100 years ago, 150 years ago, many, many theologians thought that Daniel was a fake book. That it wasn't what it claimed to be. Because there was no such person in all of recorded hi history named Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar is, is listed in history. They have recorded uh, artifacts with his name there, being king, but not Belshazzar. So obviously, whoever wrote Daniel, and it can't be Daniel, probably many, you know, about 160 years before Jesus came around, was probably somebody wrote the story, like from, you know, in hindsight. And they wrote this and they put Belshazzar there by mistake. So it really shouldn't be in the Bible. Okay, you hearing me, Phyllis? I'm hearing you. Okay, good. I want you to hear this. In 1856, the British consul, J. Taylor, is doing archaeological digs in Iraq and finds uh, these cylinders several small cylinders. They're called the Nebonidus cylinders. And on these cylinders in 1856 is written in cuneiform, which is that type of old writing, Nebonidus, king of such and such, who appointed his son Belshazzar, king of Babylon. 1856 after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of people saying Daniel's a crock, mm. God says, oh really? Let me show you. His name's Belshazzar. And he becomes king. And he rules. And he was really, really there. But Daniel faced a lot of, of skepticism for many, many years, up to about 150 years ago, because of the errors in the recorded history. And we are finding over time that those errors are not errors, they're just, you just, we just didn't know. So as we go through this, you're going to find a couple other of those that are just like that. But isn't it, isn't it cool that the wisest, wisest people of our age say, oh, the Bible's a crock. It's unreliable. It's, it's fake. And history proves, no, it's not. You just don't know everything. And I think that's very cool. I just had to bring that up for you. Yes. So, 
We open up to chapter 5. Between chapter 6, we had uh, chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar had this great moment, his great conversion moment, and then he's gone. Chapter 5, King Belshazzar. Probably his uh, grandson, maybe. Maybe his son, I don't know. But you're talking 23, 24, maybe, maybe a little bit more years between Nebuchadnezzar and the time of chapter 4 and the time of chapter 5. Okay? Long time. Babylon has declined. Daniel is old. I shouldn't say that. Let me rephrase that for the people that are in this room that are about that age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, 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 was a, he is approximately around 80, 75, somewhere around there. He, he's been around for a while in Babylon. Okay? Is that better? That's not, not, no problem. Okay, all right. Just want to make sure. <laughs> now, there's a, there is a king, a new king. His name is Cyrus. He is the king of the Medes and the Persians. So Chaldean Babylon, it, I'm going to see, how can I do this? If you're looking at a map, here's the your Tigris River and the Euphrates River. E, uh, Israel's over here. Here's Babylon. Okay? So all of this, all of this is Babylon's territory, the empire. Huge. Runs all the way from India over to the Mediterranean Sea. Massive land. And originally, Nebuchadnezzar and the media, Median king, they were partners. Okay? He, in fact, he married his, the king's daughter in order to secure it. Um, well, what has happened is up north, the Assyrians, remember the Assyrians? Well, they also had the Persians over here. The Persians get a new king, Cyrus. Cyrus realizes that he's an en you know, they're, they're enemies with the Babylonian Empire. They're not a part of the Babylonian Empire. They're under it. And what they want is they want to conquer Babylon. So he starts eating up territory. And then he makes a deal with the Median king. So now you have the Medio or Medo Persian kingdom alliance. alliance, where Cyrus is the head of both, both people. And now they together are coming down to get Babylon. Okay, you following that so far? Mind you, over here, that's Nebuchadnezzar. That's his little group out here in the oasis. He's the one that is the self-proclaimed king. Belshazzar is the co-king who sits in Babylon and does nothing else but just has big gigantic orgies. So Cyrus comes over, captures Nebuchadnezzar, uh, captures him, brings him back, and now his people and his armies are around Babylon, around the city of Babylon, and have laid it under siege two to maybe four months. But let me give you a little idea of what Babylon is like. The walls of Babylon were about 87 feet thick. 87 feet thick. They were 100 to 350 feet high. It was 15 miles around the circumference of the city. And there was no way in or no way out unless you got through the wall. That's what Cyrus and his armies are around here trying to figure out how are they going to get past this impenetrable, impossible fortress, massive city wall. That's what he's up against. He ha and so when you open up to chapter 5, that's the scenario. Chapter 5 is the night that King Cyrus and his generals and armies are around the city. They've, laid, they've had it under siege for a long time. Nebuchadnezzar is more than likely already captured. And this is the last place he's got to get. They've got to get the capital. So they're trying to get inside, figure out a way to get inside. Chapter 5 is the night that the armies get inside and capture and kill King Belshazzar. That's what we're about to read. So that's the setup. We cool with that? You got an idea of where it is? Is Daniel there? Yes. Okay. Daniel's, Daniel's, Daniel's it, is at least able to get to the palace. This is the palace area over here, supposedly. Okay? The 70 years, keep this in the back of your mind because it'll be important next 
uh, next couple chapters. The 70 years of captivity are almost finished. It is almost time for Israel to go home. That's going to play a really big role. And we'll come back to that at the end of chapter 5, why that's important, okay? So, here we go. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 5, let's read verses 1 through 4. Let's get the, set the stage here. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that they had taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now, very quickly, go back to chapter 1. Is that the big statue? That's what the big statue is made out of, isn't it? Of just gold? No, no, no. Well, there are many different gold. I mean, they had like gold calves, gold moons, gold... No, no, no. That was that was a dream. The gold image, the gold image that we we had uh, in chapter three, I believe it was. That was that we don't know exactly what that image of, was of, but there were many other gods in this city, many other temples, uh, to the moon god and to the uh, various different types. So that's who they are worshiping to, and there were different, you know, gods of silver and gods of gold and wood and a whole bunch of different ones. But look at verse 2 in chapter 1, just as a reminder. Verse 2 says, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, that's Nebuchadnezzar, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put, the treasure and put in the treasure house of his God. Now, Belshazzar is having this giant orgy, a thousand of his nobles. That's actually kind of, that's pretty small for those days. I mean, these, these days, or the, the uh, historians say that these parties used to be in the tens of thousands. There's massive, massive parties. That was very typical of that particular culture, particularly of the king, when the king held a party. So he has his wives and his concubines and all these lords, and they're having, they're getting drunk, uh, just doing all sorts of who knows what. And Belshazzar calls for the golden cups and the silver cups coming that came from the temple of God, from Jerusalem. Hmm. Does that? What do you think about that? Think it's pretty cool. I think that's dangerous. You think it's dangerous? It was when someone tried to mess with the Ark of the Covenant. Oh yeah, that was back in the Philistines, wasn't it? Yes, ma'am. Um, they're stealing other stuff. They're stealing other stuff. Well, they already stole stuff out of God's temple, where God, where they worshipped God, and now the icky king, the evil king, King Belshazzar is having a big party and he's doing a bunch of bad things. And he says, go get me the cup that the priest used in the temple and bring them to me, bring them to us so that we can put our wine and we can keep doing bad things and drinking out of God's cups. Do you think they were honoring God? Probably not, huh? Do you think God was happy or mad? Mad. You think he was mad? Very mad? Probably, huh? Their idol that they say, well, it's breaking the Ten Commandments. It is breaking the Ten Commandments, huh? Because they're worshiping an idol that it's not, that they shouldn't be worshiping, right? Only God. Only God. Well, when they did this with the, go with the goblets and they said, bring me the goblets, 
really what he's saying is, is I challenge your God. Remember, the kings used to, used to weigh gods. If I beat you, I'm a king and you're a king, and I beat you, I really, my God beat your God. So I can take the things from your God and give it to my God because my God's stronger. So Belshazzar, King Belshazzar says, go get me that wimpy God's stuff. <clears throat> really is what he's saying. Go get that to me. I'm, I'm a better, I'm a higher person than that God. I will use it for my pleasure. So go get that stuff for me. And so he does. And so they start, they start drinking. Isn't it interesting that, that the, the God that always gets defiled is not Buddha, it's not Muhammad, it's not Allah, it's not, why is it always the Christian God? Have you ever noticed that? Look around. Think of, look at, go through the news. Go through the news. It's, it's all... It's acceptable to do that too. Any other God who said that, people would be like, oh! But you say something about our God and everyone's like, oh, that's okay. Well, they're pretty mad when they made a cartoon about it. They're pretty mad when you make a cartoon when you disrespect them. And, you know, I'll, okay. But all out and out defiance, it's almost always to the Christian God. Pick a country. Pick a, pick a time. It's always the Christian God. This was strange. Let's keep reading. Let's find out what happens. I have a feeling that he's probably not going to last too much longer by shaking his fist at God, challenging God like that. Verse 5. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale as he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. He's sober. You say, what was that? What was that? I said he's sober almost. He's sober real fast. <clears throat> what do you think? What if, I mean, imagine this, you know, they, they actually found and excavated out this room in, in the Babylonian palace. It's like, a, this wall is like 165 feet long and it is plastered. They found it. And so imagine this, you're, on, you're the king, you're sitting on your little dais or whatever it's called, your little throne area, your space, and the lampstand is usually near the person of importance, right? And so... The king has a great view of this hand, these fingers that come out of almost nowhere. They're not attached to anything. And they start writing on the wall. What do you think? You've been drinking all night long, partying. You just went over and pulled all the goblets and stuff out of the temple of God. Kind of, uh, and all of a sudden this hand starts writing. Scary movie. Yeah, really, you know, all, I, when I think of that, I think of the thing from Adam's family, but that's not what he saw. He saw the hand of God or something writing on the wall. And he's terrified. Let's keep going. What happens next? Verse 7. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. So what has happened? What did he do? Nothing. He just, nobody could read it, and I was even oh. freaking out more. So pave the way for Danny. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, I know that, I know, <clears throat> Tracy's comment, pave the way for Daniel. Isn't it always that the way Daniel arrives? Daniel's not involved. He's not there in the mix of everything. He's not dirtying his hands. He's someplace else. And then what do they do? They always call in the wise men. 
the brilliant scholars and the diviners of great wisdoms and knowledge, and they come in and they're baffled. They have no idea what to do. They don't know. They can't read it. They don't know what it means. And he becomes even more terrified. They forgot about Daniel, uh, most of them anyway. Well, all but one. And that's who we're going to go find out about. Verse 10. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. O king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magi magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. This man Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means." So, back to what Tracy said. Now, <clears throat> what does she say about this man in verse 11? What does she say about Daniel? Verse 11. What does she say about this man? The spirit of the holy gods. The spirit of the holy gods. Where have we... Where, yes, where have we heard this before? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Didn't Nebuchadnezzar say in multiple times, he, is, he has the spirit of Elohim, meaning of the gods. Elohim is plural. Some translations will say the spirit of the holy God. Singular, because Elohim in Old Testament times was often used as a name for God. So this, this queen, this person, more than likely, she's probably like the mother queen, the dowager queen, maybe Belshazzar, Belshazzar's uh, mom, maybe grandma, I don't know. But she remembers Daniel. She remembers the man who has the spirit of the holy Elohim inside him. He could do it. Call for him. He'll be able to tell you, right? So what do you think? Do you think he's going to do it? All right, let's find out. 13. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you, Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and understanding wisdom, or outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Okay, what's the offer? Riches. Riches and... Prestige. There's three. The, there's three. The first one is a purple robe. What does that mean? He's going to make him royalty. I'll make you royalty. What's the second one that he's going to get? Gold, gold chain. He's going to get a gold necklace, a gold chain. It's honor. It's one of the highest levels of honor that you can bestow on, person, on a person in that era. What's the third one? Position. position. What position? Ruler. Ruler. Which one? Third highest. Third highest. Hold on a minute. Third highest ruler. Why third? Because it's him and, his, him and his co whatever and under them. Thank you. Yes, of course. The guy over there. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar is ruler one. Belshazzar is ruler two. So Daniel can't be number two. He can only be number three. That's the, that's the highest that, he, that Belshazzar can make him. Isn't that interesting how it all just fits together just like the way it's supposed to fit? <laughs> All right, let's keep going. What happens next? What does Daniel say? Verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Wow, this is a pretty bold 
Daniel. He's pretty old. He's been through a lot. He's pretty old. He's been through a lot. He's already had, he's had, he's already had all. <clears throat> Upgrade from Nebuchadnezzar, he could stand probably. Do you, does he already know what the writing says? He's got I, the 70s. I think he, he knows. Uh, he knows that if the king will be killed tonight, why would he want from him anything, and a title or anything, because he will be, uh, how do you call this? Replaced? Yeah, with, with him then. Yes. Hey, picture, picture it. He's standing before the king. The state king is saying, if you read this on the wall, this here, then uh, I'll give you all these rewards. Daniel knows what that says. We are, we, as soon as he starts talking, we know he already knows. And why? And who's behind it? And what's, gonna go, what's going down? Why would he sit there and go, now that sounds like a cool deal. Give me my gold, give me my purple robe, give me my third kingdom, and uh, you know, maybe when Cyrus comes in the front door, he won't kill me too. No, wrong, it ain't gonna happen. He knows what's going down. You had a question? Taken away, yeah, you remember that, the, that there's a king coming and, and we're going to find out what it means exactly, okay? And then Daniel's going to say something to... Belshazzar. <coughs> king Belshazzar. Let's find out, okay? <clears throat> Verse 18. Let's see what Daniel has to say. He says, I don't want your stuff, but I'm, I'll read it for you. Here we go. O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the people and nations and men of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was disposed of his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven, until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them whom or anyone he wishes. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drink wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot hear or or which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. There are three indictments, three things that Daniel accuses Belshazzar of doing. The first one is in verse 22. How would you, how would you paraphrase that? How would you put verse 22 in your own words? What is he guilty of? Thinking himself higher than God. Right. Pride. There's something more. Well, he dishonored Put in holy it. things. He dishonored holy things. That would be one of the. Well, there you go. He, he knew. knew. Oh. He knew. He knew the God that had done this to Nebuchadnezzar, his father or grandfather, whichever you want to, however you want to look at it. By the way, there's no word for grandfather in the language. It's, you'd have to say father, father. He knew. He knew. And even though he knew, he still rebelled. He still raised himself up above God. 
He still said, it is my kingdom, my glory, my majesty. Aren't I all that? Even though he knew. What was the next thing he did? That's in the first part of 23. Hmm? So you praised. It starts, you praised. You praised the goddess of silver and gold, of, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Other gods before God. Other gods before God. Open idolatry. Yeah, it says you set yourself up against the Lord. Yep. You rebelled. You set your heart up against God. You said, I'm going to be greater than God. I'm going to, even though I knew it, I knew what he had done. Open idolatry. Last one, number three, is in the last part of verse 23. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and your, all your ways. This guy was bad. But hang on a minute. Keep your finger here. But flip over to Romans chapter 1. It's on page 1747 in the Black Bibles. <coughs> Romans, what? Romans chapter 1. So we have Belshazzar who rebelled openly, challenged God knowing the truth. Open idolatry and dishonoring God. Those are his three that he gets. Okay? Listen to Paul's comment about mankind in general, which we all fit into, by the way. Starting in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, there's that new, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. How different is Belshazzar's sin from anyone else's? It's, it's very common, it seems to me, and what, what keeps popping into my head, I don't know if this is distracting your message, but when we get out of line, we who trust God and are children of God, and we try to get away with sinning mm -hmm. or putting another God before him, God corrects us. He punishes us. He steps in and says, oh, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. You're my child, I love you, you will not do that. But how long did Bel Belshazzar? Belshazzar get away with opposing God and everything he knew that was right? And God <coughs> held back. <coughs> and he held back. And years probably went by. And so he wasn't disciplined, but Belshazzar was not disciplined. Right. So it kind of shows you, it makes you feel good that God won't let us, who have the same nature, to wander. He doesn't let us. Okay, I, I like that. I want it because that's a good, good, good application of this. 
If we are God's children, God will not allow us to get away with it forever. He's going to discipline us. He's going to correct us and bring us back on track. Yes. Right? Yes. Belshazzar seemed to have gone on for a long, 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 long time and God hadn't done anything. And ends up at the end, and we're going to read it here, there's judgment coming. Right? Okay. So... I'm living in today. I'm not living in that time. That's a long time ago. I'm not even living in Jesus' era, the early church era. What can I learn from this? How about this one? If I can, if I can sin and I am not disciplined, should I be worried? Yes. Mm -hmm. If, let's take it a little bit bigger. If the United States, a nation, rises up after being blessed as much as, it is, as it's been blessed and decides to raise up against the Lord, kick out the Lord, I don't need the Lord, is it possible that it's, it's going to fall the same sort of routine that Babylon fought, fell into Remember, when King Nebuchadnezzar is around, it's glorious. It's wonderful. The tree's full, remember? Right. And now it's starting to decline. And as it's declining, as it's going down, as it's becoming more debauched, more wicked, more idolatrous, God says, my spirit will not strive with man forever. There's going to be a day, and I'm going to... And it will be over. And I think we have that here. Let's find out. Yes. One more thing is there was uh, <clears throat> something that happened to Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. that straightened him out. Yes. But nothing happened to Belshazzar. Correct. He didn't have his, his years as an animal. Right. To, to make him turn around. What, you think he was waiting for it? Or daring God? Belshazzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a change of heart for the first time. Um, what was the first incident? Uh, the statue, the dream. That's it, the dream. So he praised, he pra he, I think Nebuchadnezzar uh, recognized and feared God after the first incident, where probably Belshazzar did not. He, you, know, he, you know what I mean? But did Belshazzar have any incident, any first incident? No, but he oh. knew of it. That's the thing. That's true. This is why I think they kind of had different situations, because you come in in Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't know God, he doesn't know anything about God, and then God, is, he shows himself to him Perfect. bit by bit over time. So he goes from not knowing him to knowing him. But um, his son, there, he probably knew about him as he was growing up because these things had happened. He'd heard about it. So I see kind of as a different situation. Well, not only that, it, there were several incidences where, you know, after the statue, for instance, dream, there was the, uh, there was one where the, the three friends were supposed to go into the furnace. Well, that would have been afterwards, right? Yeah. So he, had a, he didn't have a complete knowledge of God. No. Correct. Even though he was humble. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. Maybe. Let's see. <laughs> yes, sir. I was going to say that uh, God disciplines or punishes different people in different ways. He does. You know, the two sons of Aaron. Yes, the two sons of Aaron. Them, they committed one bad sin and God blocked them off right there. They had no chance to repent or do anything. Well, they had, they, had, they had committed a long series of sins, and at one point they got to a place, because they were already bad. They were, they were told that they were bad, that they were cheating the people. And at that point... The sons of Aaron? Yeah. Eli was told. Yeah, I believe so. Didn't they come in and offer, the ones that offered bat, the strange fire? Yeah. Yeah, I believe that they, I believe they were just them. shot right out and incinerated them, yeah. right? How about Ananias? Was it Eli's son? That was, that was Eli's son. You're right. How about Ananias and Sapphira? Oh, yeah. What about them? That's New Testament, isn't it? Dead, One light. One light. Boom. Gone. Great will, way to build a church. Yeah. You're right. God does discipline different people in different ways. But here's, here's the flip side of that exact same coin. And this is where I said I might get into trouble. 
What, what does Nebuchadnezzar receive that Belshazzar doesn't seem to receive? Grace. Huh? Grace. Grace. Belshazzar, like the sons of Aaron, receive no grace. They get no second chance, per se. They don't get a warning, I'm going to come get you. Like even, even the Ninevites in Jonah's day got a warning. Did God, was God obligated to give them a warning? No. He could have wiped them out and he would be perfectly just, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is he unjust for wiping out Belshazzar? No, he sinned. He's guilty. If he had wiped out Nebuchadnezzar, would he have been completely just? Yes. Yes. So what is the grace that he gave Nebuchadnezzar? That's, that's unfair. Right? He turned no. him, he, God turned him into an it's animal favor. to bless him in the end. Favor. Is mercy. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, it is God intervening, jumping into someone's life and saying, I'm, I'm going to give you some of my attention. You're not going to like it. You're probably not going to like it, but uh, think about it from uh, the Apostle Paul. How about the Apostle Paul? We were talking about this this afternoon. The Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. Blameless before the law. He kept everything. He knew it. Backwards, forwards, taught by the best. And he's out there slaughtering and, 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 and capturing those Christian people, those of the way, those people that are out there that are blaspheming God with saying that this Jesus person is God. And he's on his way. He is not, he's not following an evangelist going, oh, I wonder if I should think about it. He's not walking down an aisle. He's out to go get somebody and, in Damascus and bring them back for trial. He has papers. He has authority to take care of it. And he is on his way, and Jesus, glorified king, smacks him off of his donkey or horse or whatever he was riding, puts him on his back, and says, excuse me, why are you persecuting me? He's blind. He, and instantly, that fast, that fast, Paul has a conversion moment. Oh, what if Jesus had never knocked him off his horse and knocked him on his backside? What if Jesus had never spoke to him and said, why are you persecuting me? What would have happened to Paul? He, kept doing what been doing. he would have kept on going. He really felt that he was doing right. The sovereignty of God to intervene into our lives, shake us up, smack us around, put his foot on our neck and say, excuse me, what are you doing? He has total right to do that. Was it, was it a, a horrible thing, a mean thing for Christ to knock him off of his horse? Some people might tell you that. No. That God, God isn't the mean God of the Bible who does things like that. Yes, he does, and, and you better hope and pray he does it to you. Yes. We were talking in, in Sunday school today about these conversions, these moments, and for instance, C.S. Lewis. Everybody know C.S. Lewis? Chronicles of Narnia? Yeah. Lion, the Witch, World, that guy, right? Mm -hmm. he, he writes about how God had to chase him down, grab him, and drag him to heaven. Drag him to the cross. He fought every last bit of the way. But God captured his heart. Christ killed him. Ah, oh, that's grace. That's grace. Nebuchadnezzar got a wonderful amount of grace. God intervened and God made sure. It cost Nebuchadnezzar seven years of a life. But I, I would probably venture to say that when we get to heaven, I'm going to see Nebuchadnezzar. I believe with all my heart I'm going to see Nebuchadnezzar. That's a wonderful praise that he gives. Let's go back to Belshazzar. Did Belshazzar get that type of grace? Did he get that kind of intervention? Or did he get a different type of intervention? Let's see. Reading the rest of the chapter, starting in verse 
25. This is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. This is what these words mean, Mene. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, how did God do this? God put it in the hearts of the Medes and the Persians outside the gates, these impenetrable gates or walls. The Euphrates River ran underneath the wall. But it's too deep. They couldn't do anything with it. There's no way they could get underneath the walls. It's 87 feet trying to swim underneath these walls. They didn't have any idea what was underneath them. So the Medes and the Persians put a dam up here and diverted the water to a swamp over on the side until the river almost dried out, knee deep, knee ankle deep. And then they just walked underneath the wall. That's what I would have done. And when they got there, <laughs> and when they got there, everybody's drunk with a, and having a party and just a wild orgy lost. They're just, it was an easy win. Wow. God just said, here, take it. Belshazzar, your time's over. Yes, Patrick. Why was the language so hard to understand? It seems to be in Chaldean or Hebrew or whatever it says on the bottom. It, it gives definitions of what these words mean. And why didn't these nobles know what this meant? What Aramaic, I don't know why. Maybe, maybe they were too drunk to read it. Maybe they, were, they didn't have the, an idea of what it was. Maybe it's been translated to these particular words because the actual words are not there's there's it's it's just it's scribble so they would have to scribble it perhaps this is it's god's language his own personal private language or something we i don't know but in order to communicate it to us they have to give some word for us to understand what that there was a word on the wall god always makes it so daniel has to reveal it to them isn't that amazing so however it was he made it so God, or Daniel had to reveal it to them. That's right. So judgment came. Cyrus, King Cyrus has taken over. Medes and Persians have taken over. But we got a little bit of a problem. Uh, who found the problem? Yes, ma'am. That they, he, they still clothed Daniel in purple and gold and all that. Well, they still clothed him. He still got all his stuff. I don't think, I don't think that's the problem that we have here at, at this end, but... Name Darius? Huh? Name Darius? Yes. Who's the one that was told took over Babylon? I Yes, ma'am. Um, why did he drink of um, the, the cups? Because he was proud and had an icky heart. Yes. Like a whip? And you, and you cut the well, you did this in history class, remember, with King Cyrus? So what's yep. the problem with Darius? Yeah, that's Look at the last line. Look, verse 31. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Verse 1 of chapter 6, it pleased Darius. Where's Cyrus? But he said they split the kingdom. No, that was the ones beforehand. That was Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Who's this Darius guy? Oh, Daniel, you're just all messed up again. It's time to throw this whole book away. Yes? He was a Mede or a Persian, and the Medes and the Persians, they got together. So he's one of the two. I, I'm not understanding. <coughs> all right. This is another, to this day, it's a mystery. They don't know who Darius is because he's not mentioned anywhere. Again, 
So until we find another cylinder or something to get it, we only have a couple clues. One is Daniel's prophecy, his, his writing, is flawed. It wasn't written by him, and we should throw it away. Since I don't believe that's the case, you have two other choices. Either A, Darius is just a title, like king, ruler, conqueror, something to that effect, which does show up in the Mede and Medo-Persian Empire several times. There's going to be one later on down the road, like a Darius the Third or Darius the Fourth. It's just, it may be just a title for uh, Cyrus. However, Cyrus wasn't a Mede. He was a Persian. Maybe he was just appointed by Cyrus. Some dude did. Well, here's the other option. Remember, Cyrus is trying to conquer a huge empire. This is only one city. There was a general that was in charge of this uh, whole deal, and I can't pronounce his name. It starts with a U. <coughs> but it's very possible that he was given the title of Darius the king or Darius the, the ruler, whatever, and made and put in charge while King Cyrus and the armies are out getting the rest of the territory. So these next couple chapters, or this next chapter, like da da Daniel in the lion's den, that talks about Darius the king doing all this, may have been Cyrus's general who's been put in charge of this particular area. And that may be the logical reason for it. But we don't know. It might just be Cyrus. And just another name for him. We don't know. But we're going to close with a little passage. And this is why I say it's important. Because all of the Bible has to not contradict. There's not a part of the Bible that contradicts another part of the Bible. You can't have that, right? Mm -hmm. If you do, one of them is wrong or both are wrong. Does that make sense? Or your understanding. Or your understanding's off. Go back to Isaiah 44. It's on page 1130 in the Black Bibles. Isaiah, Isaiah 44, and it'll start in verse 24. And I want to read something to you. This Isaiah, when was Isaiah? We did a little bit of Isaiah. When was Isaiah around? When did he start writing? In the middle of... 80 to 100, maybe 100, even 125, something like that, years prior to the time that we just read. Prior to the conquering of Babylon... Isaiah writes, prior to them going into exile, Isaiah writes. So you're talking 80 to 100, 150 years, somewhere around there. Long time before Cyrus is born. Isaiah speaks, and here's what Isaiah, or the Lord says through Isaiah, starting in verse 24. What chapter? Uh, 44. Okay. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of it, Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, of the towns of Judah, it shall be built, and of their ruins I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus. Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. 
For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know there is none besides me. I am am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. <coughs> 150, 100 years before Cyrus is born, the Lord says, I summon you by name. Cyrus will be my shepherd. He will be the one that I lift up. I'll give him plenty. I'll, I'll, I'll make it happen. For what cause? For what reason? You want to know what reason? I'll tell you the reason. Flip back to Ezra. And this is where we will stop. Ezra chapter 1. It's on page 732. Ezra chapter 1. My Bible says that Cyrus, a king of Persia, mm -hmm. ruled from about 550 to 530 BC. Mm -hmm. yep. Ezra chapter 1. Ezra is a priest. This is at the end of the Babylonian exile. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what, the king, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build the temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Full circle. What is Cyrus being given a chance to do? Why, is he, why was he summoned by name? To end the captivity. God's 70 years is finished. His punishment and his, his, his discipline on his people is finished. It's coming to an end. And so he raises up Cyrus, calls him out a hundred years before he's ever born. Do you know what is another interesting thing? I'll give you a little bit of a little tidbit. What did God call him? He is my shepherd. Sh shepherd. Do you know how he came to be? His grandfather was the king of Persia, had a dream that Cyrus, the baby, was going to raise up someday and oh, knock him off the throne. So he told his number one henchman, go out and kill him. Take the baby and go kill my grandson. The guy couldn't do it. So he goes into the mountains and he finds a shepherd, shepherd and says, you do it. Shepherd takes the shepherd, takes the Cyrus baby home. Mama sees it. Mama has never had babies. He, she can't have babies. So she says, oh, look what the gods have given us. Let's raise him as our own. And he, ra he is raised as a shepherd. And then is brought back and takes over the kingdom of, from his grandfather later. You have to tell me how grandfather recognized... Oh yeah, his grandfather recognized him when he got older. And his henchman, he, she told his henchman, said, I thought, you, I thought I told you to go kill him. He said, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. And then goes to Cyrus and says... I, I, will, I will fight on your side if you want to overthrow your grandfather yeah, and help him overthrow. Wow. I'm telling you, this God, and this is what I'm trying to get at. This is, this is what I take away from this particular section. Because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to sit there and go, again and again, we seem to have this, you know, here comes Daniel again. Go get Daniel. Here's Belshazzar. He's out. He's gone. 
Here's one kingdom gone, new kingdom coming up. And I'm thinking in my head, what is it that God is saying in all this? What's happening behind all this? It is that look at all the different things. You have Isaiah, who through, God through Isaiah is proclaiming in the future, a hundred years or so before he is ever born, I will raise up my shepherd. And God is over in the Persia, in the working over here in Persia with the grandfather and ends up, I mean, all this is happening over here and he's working with his people over here in Bab back in Babylon and he's, Belshazzar is coming up and he's this, this foolish, foolish, evil, wicked man and I'm going to bring judgment here and so here, let's get this Cyrus guy and I'm going to bring him up here. Why? Because the 70 years are up. It's not 71, it's not 69, it is 70 because God said 70 years. Not 71, 3, 4, 5. God said 70 years. It was 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, Babylon kingdom is destroyed. The 70 years is finished. And Cyrus in his first year says, The Lord has laid it upon my heart to send his people home. You want to go home? God be with you. Go build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel. So why? What did Isaiah say? Why did God do all this? Go back to Isaiah. If you don't know, go back to Isaiah. Yes, yes, yes. Ding, 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 ding. Yes. So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. I, 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 I. It's not about you. It's about me. Amen. That's what this story is about. That's what Daniel is just, is just shaking through the whole, the whole book of Daniel. I will make a name for myself, he says in Exodus. He said it in Ezekiel. He said it again and again and again. I will make a name for myself. I will, they will know that I am the Lord. And he see, we see it again through all the inner workings and everything. Now, what possible chaos is in your life that God doesn't have in control? If he's able to orchestrate all of this, all the hundreds and thousands of lives and thoughts and hearts and little things that go on to get this to happen exactly the way he said it's going to be, what little itty bitty nothing of a chaos do you have in your life that God can't handle? You think God's up there banging his head because of what's going on in your life or what's going on in my life? He's God. That's an amen. You can say amen, amen for that. Thank you. Yes. He knows when the, when the sparrow falls. Everything. Knows. Everything. Everything. He says, look at, look at, all, look at who I am. Do you trust who I am? Look at history. History shows you who I am. Again and again and again and again, he's opening himself up to us to see who he is. And he says, I love you. I've sent my son for you. You are my child. How much more will a father give to his children? Yes. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto you. Seek him first. Seek him first. Give him the honor. Give him the praise. Give him the acknowledgement. Give him the thanks. And then watch what happens. It may be a long time. It may not be the way we want. But you know what? He brings up the sun. He brings down the sun. He calls the stars out by name. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too chaotic, no mess too big. He's God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you.